Uh, this is a very special venue for me. Uh, for those of you who heard me speak before, in that room back there in 1986, I came to this town uh, at age 23 with a law degree, um, passed the bar, and in September I was married and uh, we had our rehearsal dinner right in there in 1986. So this is a very, very special place for me. Uh, when I was elected to Congress, uh, like most freshmen, I was not privileged to get put on the best committees, and that's very typical. But I worked very hard to make absolutely certain that I would be able to move up. And fortunately, uh, in my second term, I was placed on the very powerful House Appropriations Committee. That is the committee, and, and thank you, sir, for saying that, that handles all of the discretionary spending in Congress. What does that mean? Defense, Department of Energy, uh, you name it. Everything that is not on the mandatory side of the equation. It's a privilege to get on the Energy and Water Subcommittee very early, thanks to work done by then Senator Alexander and late Senator Howard Baker. So I was in a pretty good position my second term to move forward. Going forward, after years of very hard work and uh, getting a lot done, I have a few stories about that, I'll keep them short, I was privileged to be moved up and to begin this Congress, I became chairman, or as we affectionately call in DC dialect, a cardinal um, over the Energy and Water Subcommittee. What does that do? That funds the Department of Energy, it funds the Army Corps of Engineers, yes, full funding for the Chickamauga Lock, we got that done last year, and the Bureau of Reclamation. So it's been uh, a committee that I was very familiar with, did a lot of work, but near and dear to my heart, and to our great nuclear Navy, um, we fund, through the Department of Energy, um, the NNSA. I want to be very serious about that is the National Nuclear Security Administration. What do they do? They are actually responsible, and we are responsible, for funding of our nuclear deterrent, our nuclear weapons. And I am here to tell you tonight that through my work last year and this year, we are revitalizing and working very hard to update our nuclear weapons for our triad, which seriously is our great United States Navy and our Air Force that do a tremendous job. Right now, actually, General Cotton is over uh, the uh, STRATCOM, which is very good. They switched that command back and forth between Navy and Air Force. So that's what I do. However, got a little surprise earlier this year. I serve on the Labor, Education, Health, and Human Services Subcommittee. Uh, that is the second largest pot of money to defense and I've enjoyed that. I've got about, thir about the third seat on that committee. But I was on state and foreign operations. I love foreign policy, and I do a lot in foreign policy and domestic policy. So I try to touch as many things as I can. But a coveted slot on the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee was open. Now, it became very competitive. I am here to tell you that some of the people in this room, Ray, Jules, we worked very hard. It took months, but about four months ago, well, maybe five months ago, I was awarded a slot on the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee. So very fortunate to have that. What does, thank you. What does that mean? That means now I'm not only in charge of the procurement of nuclear weapons, I'm also uh, able to fund the customer as well, the Department of Defense and all that it does. So I've actually got the best hand of any appropriator in the United States House So with, with the subcommittees I've got. Uh, a couple of very quick points. Um, I've got all of your legislation. Uh, I don't wanna short our distinguished second speaker, but just to let you know, I have a 100% uh, sign on on every piece of legislation that MOA has asked me to sign on. And if I don't do it, I get a call from Ray Atkins to get on there that day. So uh, we are good to go with that. I'm willing to take questions. On a very serious note, I want to try to put this in perspective. Why is it important that I've got the hand that I've got? Well, literally, uh, we were celebrating our 75th wonderful year 
of our armed forces parade, uninterrupted through COVID, through good times and bad this year. Now, Jules and I were working for months, literally to try to get a speaker. Many of the folks in this room said, get a speaker. I was appointed to the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, and two days later, I went to go see the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Austin. And I said, Mr. Secretary, we wrote you a letter. And he was very nice. He said, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I said, I need a four-star in Chattanooga. Two days later, General Mingus called, and we had a four-star in Chattanooga. So thank you. Uh, appreciate that much. We had a wonderful 75th. I know Colonel Brooks, thank you. You're, you're always there, uh, not only for our, our parades, but doing all the other work out in the, in the provinces with me. Thank you with our students, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, before I take questions, one very good and touching story uh, that should touch all of us. My father was in the Army in World War II. My uncle was a Marine, came home in a body cast uh, from the South Pacific. They come home, uh, live the great life. Bottom line, uh, my father in law was in the Air Force. They're all interred at the National Cemetery here. Uh, we've spent a lot of time there over the years. It is a beautiful place, hallowed ground. So God bless the men and women who are there. But it's filling up, and it's been filling up for quite some time. Well, a good friend of mine came to me and said, I have a beautiful piece of land in the great state of Tennessee that I'm willing to let the Department of Veterans Affairs have at about half the cost of that land. He could have sold it for a big profit, but he wanted the VA to have it so that we can have an extension of our national cemetery. So we basically set it up and he went to closing. The VA did not show up. My friend called me. He said, the VA just didn't show up. He said, show up in a month. A month later, the VA didn't show up. At that point in time, he was rather upset. Because I keep an open door policy, and I've done that through three administrations now, I called my friend, and he is my friend, Secretary McDonough, who's over the Veterans Affairs, uh, a Secretary of Veterans Affairs, a great American, a great patriot. He does not share my party affiliation, that's okay. When it comes to our veterans, we put partisanship aside now and always. He came to my office, we went closed door. He brought General Quinn with him, who was the head of the uh, military cemeteries. And he looked at me and he said, sir, I have no idea, Mr. Chairman, what's gone wrong. I have absolutely no idea. I know him to be an honest man, and he is an honest man. He said, will you give me some time and not go public with the problems? I said, absolutely. I trust you, you trust me, we've got to get this done. And I said one thing for sure. I said, Mr. Secretary, that cemetery has got to be in the great state of Tennessee. I love our friends in Georgia. I love our friends in Alabama. I know politics can get involved and these things can get moved. I want that cemetery in Tennessee. I want the deal done. About eight months later, there was a knock at the door. It was Secretary McDonough. Now, we had played sports, we played sports together, we both played on the football team, um, and he showed up. And he looked at me and said, Mr. Chairman, you were right and we were wrong. We left it at that. They set a closing, they closed the deal. Now we have probably what's going to be probably one of the most beautiful military cemeteries in the country. It's gonna be in Meigs County, in the great state of Tennessee, and it's going to serve our veterans and their families' needs for internment for at least two to three hundred years. Moreover, well, the story is never let partisan politics get involved when it comes to veterans. Always keep an open door policy, and when you're dealing with somebody who you know is trying to do their best, you don't run to the media and rat them out. Uh, Josh Rose did a tremendous story on this. Give him credit, he just did an outstanding job. With that, uh, I love my job. I love the position I'm in. I work hard every day. Uh, Jules Dew does a tremendous job in my office on not only veteran affairs, but active military affairs. Uh, it's amazing the calls that we get from men and women on active duty who have real problems that need to be solved. 
and he steps up and he gets it done. So appreciate that. Also, before I take questions, we have the best with a capital B military uh, academy program in the country. Other offices, Republican and Democratic, come to us and want to follow our lead. It's not political. We have a great group of men and women, uh, some of whom are flag officers, some of whom are, are, are colonels. Uh, many went to ROTC, many went to the academies. We place a lot of students in the academies. We have a high retention rate and they do an outstanding job. So thank you to those who serve so that you know my board that we use gives me the names. So I don't go out and just pick somebody because I might know them or their parents. There is a screening process. I get literally the best. So I've had the wing commander at the Air Force Academy uh, before. We've had some tremendous, tremendous students uh, go through and are on active duty now. So thank you. And I would love to open up. Uh, how about three questions so we can hear our next distinguished speaker? Anything you want? Yes, sir. Our guest tonight, right? From the Air Force, the Colonel. That's right. What's your view as to what November looks like from your perspective? Sure. Um, I've got a bit of a biased view, okay? I'm always gonna I'm always gonna shoot you straight. We we did a poll recently and I don't get eighty four percent of the vote uh, when I in this district, got about 68% and, and, and I win. But 84% of my constituents, whether they love me or not, said it was honest. So I'll always be honest with you. Um, here's, here's my view. I think Trump wins in the Electoral College. Uh, I think the United States Senate will be Republican probably by about two or three states. If we have a really good night, maybe four or five. Um, the House is a toss up. Uh, it will be probably either up five to seven uh, or down five. Uh, the reality is in the house where I served is only about 36 to 38 swing districts. Um, but the, the big prize obviously is the White House and the, re and the reality is it's gonna come down to the swing states. So look to Pennsylvania, look to Wisconsin, look to Michigan, uh, Arizona, Nevada. Um, the swing states, the, the map has changed uh, since President Biden dropped out. Um, Vice President Harris is a much more competitive candidate that is helping the other side down ballot. There's no question about it. But um, if you were to ask me what, what's gonna happen in the Electoral College, um, I, think, I think Trump will win. I do not see a landslide, but uh, I do see the Electoral College win. It's a, it's a fair, very fair question. Thank you for the privilege of being with you all today. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to serve you all, uh, but you all are my heroes. Thank you so much and God bless you.